Thanks for having us. Um, we're going to try to talk for about 10 minutes and then open up the room to discussion because we'd really like to get some feedback from y'all. Um, and I'm going to be going over just a brief uh, history of Open Michigan, Open Michigan to get you situated a little bit to our specific circumstances at our university. And you're pretty much looking at the Open Michigan team here. Um, so we're not very big, we're very grassroots based. Um, and then I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of the challenges that we faced that led to a new collection guideline that we developed and try to get your feedback from that and your experiences of sharing at your own university and institution. So questions to consider that we'll be bring, bringing this slide up again later um, that you can keep in mind maybe while we're talking are, you know, what are your drivers, um, how are you sharing, how did these models shifting, um, how do we align everyday practices with our own mission and our perspective and our values as open educators. Um, and you can also, uh, th these links will be up throughout the entire presentation so you can get on the Etherpad instance and write notes or ask questions if you want to do that and check out the presentation as well. So Open Michigan um, was a pilot project that was started in 2007 by a faculty member at the School of Information who was really interested in the open courseware model that was put forth by MIT. But he quickly realized that that model was not going to work for our university. We are very, pretty large. We're 40,000 students, about 20,000 faculty and staff members, and we have a robust health system as well. And we're very decentralized, so a lot of our schools and our colleges act pretty autonomously um, from each other. And so we decided that we needed to develop a model that would um, encourage the production of open educational resources, but from a participatory distributed perspective. So we developed the Describe model, and we focused the first two years of our initiative on developing processes that supported this model, developing tools and policies and infrastructure that supported this model. And what this does is it engages mostly students as volunteers who identify course content or faculty members that they want to work with to create open educational resources. So a lot of this was very course-based at, at the beginning as well. So we developed things like ORCA, which is our content um, tracking system, so that the people who are describes can track the copyright decisions they're making, and they can communicate with the Open Michigan team. And what we do is we actually um, go through and replace copyrighted material to the extent possible with openly licensed alternatives. So this is a space where you can do that. You can track all your decisions. We also hosted regular meetings for these describes. So these are cohorts of students that we brought together. Oh, it's kind of dark. But um, we fed them lots of really good food. I will say this is Greg Grossmeyer, who used to work with um, Open Michigan and is now at Creative Commons. Um, and we tried to build a community around the creation of open educational resources and around the creation um, and practices of open education in general. Um, and we also use this model for some of our international partnerships that you see up in the corner with um, some African health sciences institutions. But this was really, it was a robust process for creating open educational resources, but it was really time intensive. And all of our efforts were developed uh, or were used to produce these course-based materials. This is an old screenshot of our collection. And these materials are um, really robust OER in the sense that they can be downloaded. They're available in multiple formats. They're available in modular sections, so you can pull pieces out and repurpose them very easily. And to the extent possible, we don't rely on fair use, especially because of an international context context where um, faculty members, teachers, self-learners need to be able to recreate materials using this um, that can't rely on fair use and can't rely on that interpretation. But in the meantime, we're doing all of this work. We're producing very course-based open educational resources. And we're seeing examples all across our university of departments, of faculty members, of teachers, of students, developing resources or developing experiences that they want to share with the broader education community. But they're not doing it the way that we do it. They're not doing it in the full, robust sense of making open educational resources. So maybe they're putting their stuff up on a website that they say, please reuse this material, but they're not thinking about packaging it. They're not thinking about making it adaptable, and they're not using licenses, but they're still sharing, right? And they still are part of this culture of sharing at the university. So this is a big gap for us. 
So we decided to focus on the next two years of our initiative on really focusing the community efforts um, of the people who are interested in sharing at our university. So we started doing trainings, we started doing workshops, we started doing um, what we call design jams, and we started working with different community members at the University of Michigan, especially students, to teach them about open practices more broadly. So how do you incorporate themes of participation? How do you think about transparency? How do you think about collaboration? And then these open educational resources become kind of a byproduct of this process of open education and engaging in open education. And so um, this has been a really fun thing for us to do, and it's changed what our collection looks like on Open Michigan now. It's not so course-based anymore. It's a lot of different types of learning experiences. It's a lot of different materials that show the process of learning as much as the outcome of learning. And so we also um, used a lot of this experience and a lot of the research that we've done in the last two years to figure out how we can also um, engage with the broader open education community. So two members of the Open Michigan team actually went to, um, two other members of the Open Michigan team went to Berlin over the summer and participated in the developing some of the first School of Open courses. And we used a lot of our research from a badging pilot that we had developed at the University of Michigan to kind of inform what these courses might look like. And we're also working to um, package our Describe process and our training materials that we think are still very valuable and we get a lot of requests for into the peer-to-peer -peer university platform so that they can be adopted and used by other institutions. Um, but still, we're seeing this stuff. So there's still a gap between what we're doing, what we're producing, what we're showcasing on our website and our collection as open education or as open educational resources and the practices that are happening at the university. So what did we do to try to address that gap? And Dave's going to talk to you about that. Yeah, so uh, we started thinking about how we might represent this free educational content on Open Michigan um, and how we might build upon it or use it um, as a way to encourage a variety of open practices uh, with the goal of shifting the culture towards sharing and sharing well at U of M. But we didn't have anything to guide our decisions um, for what to include on Open Michigan, what to reference, and what to promote. Um, other than is it OER or not OER. And so this lack of guidance um, kept Open Michigan from representing or highlighting all of the different ways the community was sharing um, educational materials. Um, so we started working on uh, collection guidelines, and there are really uh, three main parts to this. And this is also available in the Etherpad, so if you go there you can um, add notes and whatnot too, that would be great. Um, so this first part states what you can expect from the Open Michigan collection. Uh, mainly that it's a place to find UM teaching, learning materials and experiences, and that Open Michigan is not a long-term digital archive. Um, for that, we send our materials to um, University of Michigan's institutional repository, um, known as Deep Blue. Uh, the, second, the second part details uh, the scope of hosted educational content, uh, mainly all the different types of OER, lectures, lecture videos, open textbooks that are licensed uh, for remixing. Uh, so the third part details the scope of referenced educational content. This is all the different types of resources and experiences that live out in the wild and are of interest to us and our community. But since they're not openly licensed, uh, we're not hosting them on Open Michigan. We're just providing links to the materials um, from a landing page. All right, so let's take a look at some examples um, that fall within the scope of hosted educational content, otherwise known as traditional OER. So here is Stats 250. I'm sure most of you have seen OER like this, uh, but on the site, an overview of the course is provided. Uh, that's the block of text there in the middle. Uh, these bars um, down at the bottom also drop down to reveal the syllabus and some uh, information about the instructor. Uh, and just beneath those, you can see the uh, CC BY license uh, that was selected for the purpose of sharing these materials. Uh, then under the Materials tab, uh, we have all kinds of materials ordered by type, which are available for download in multiple formats. Um, the license information and author information is also included uh, on the right-hand side there. So uh, these are just some more materials under the materials tabs with uh, links out to the lectures on YouTube. So lastly, we have an option to organize the materials by subject or week or in some other way within uh, the sessions tab. Uh, and this just gives us a little bit more flexibility on how we display uh, course and resources on site. So that was a traditional open course on Open Michigan, 
Um, here we have something a little different, but prior to thinking about the collection guidelines, this is something that we didn't include on the site. Uh, so this is a chemistry course where students edited Wikipedia articles for class assignments. Uh, like the last example, we do have an openly licensed syllabus and a couple OERs associated with the course. But what's really exciting um, about this is what can be found within the sessions tab. And so here we have a list of all the Wikipedia articles that the students uh, edited and created for the class. Um, and you can also see before, after, and current versions of the article, which is a really cool way to see how much openly licensed content the students uh, produce for the class. There's images, text, animations, um, which are all available on uh, Wikimedia Commons and Wikipedia. So now let's take a look at some examples that fall within the scope of referenced educational content. Here's an example of a course on Shakespeare's principal plays, um, where the audio lectures are available for download on iTunes U. However, the audio lectures are not openly licensed, so we're not going to host them on Open Michigan, nor do we have permission to. But we can provide a link to the lectures um, on iTunes U. And since the plays that are discussed in the course are in the public domain, uh, we can add links to open versions of the plays um, on Hathi Trust. So here's how that looks under the materials tab. You can see the link to uh, the courses or the lecture materials on iTunes U. Click there, it'll bring you out to iTunes U. You can download them. Uh, but then we also have the links on Hathi Trust that will bring you to free and open versions of the plays that are discussed in the course. And so, since we're referencing educational content for U of M, uh, we do have landing pages and links to U of M Coursera courses. Um, here's Chuck Severance's Internet History, Technology, and Security course. Um, but what's nice about this example is since we already um, have a place for this course on Open Michigan, when Chuck decided that he wanted to share the lectures um, that were used for the course, we had a natural place for him to do so. So under the Materials tab, we have the um, Coursera lectures that are openly licensed available so anyone can download and remix. Lastly, um, here's a landing page for a school of open, I'm sorry, for a school of public health course that requires students to post weekly blog articles uh, where they attempt to translate complex science into something a broader audience can understand. One thing that's really interesting about this blog is that anyone can become a mentor for the class, provide feedback, and participate. So there really isn't anything fancy about this. Uh, you know, it's just a landing page with a link out to the blog. Um, and here's the blog. But uh, this instructor is someone that we'll want to follow up with. And when we do, we can already show him that he's recognized as someone who's sharing and creating uh, open educational experiences. And that he's not, and his work is not, and the students' work is not, are not uh, excluded from uh, the site because you know, they haven't figured out or you know, they haven't selected an open license just yet. And so again, our goal with this document is to provide guidelines for more accurately representing all the types of sharing that are taking place within our community, while at the same time encouraging a variety of open practices that we hope will shift the culture towards sharing and sharing well at U of M. Uh, we're aware that there's a balance here, and that's something that we're really trying to figure out. Uh, so we'd love to hear all of your thoughts on this stuff. And I guess we'll go back to the questions that we had at the, the top of the lecture. So our big um, inflection point was when we realized, you know, are, are we Open Michigan or are we Michigan OER? What, what do we actually want to support at our university? And we are a very grassroots effort, and we want to share robust materials that can be repurposed by other institutions, but we also want to cultivate a community of sharing and shift that perspective at our university um, toward teachers and learners thinking of themselves as participating in a larger global education movement. So um, this seems kind of like a, a small thing, but it, it really was um, the result of a lot of conversations, internal conversations that we had. And we're still trying to struggle, you know, a little bit struggling with are we gatekeepers? This, this puts a lot more interpretation on us to identify different kinds of open stuff in a way um, and, and figure out how to represent that. But we really wanted to showcase the different types of sharing that were happening on our campus.